Good morning, good morning. All right, y'all, y'all were ready to worship the Lord this morning. We need your help. Y'all don't make me bring some people from the second service. Come over and show y'all how to worship the Lord, all right? Man, they get into it. I know they got more sleep, but we got more numbers. So let's give God some praise this morning. Thank you. 
All right. Listen to what you're going to sing this morning. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in
morning y'all all right are y'all ready because i don't know if i'm ready but here we go all right turn in your bibles with me this morning second timothy chapter two second timothy chapter two i'm gonna go with verses three and four and then i'll let y'all sit down all right second timothy chapter two verses three and four when you're there say amen, amen. all right so, 3 and 4. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that we may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. All right, so Heavenly Father, Lord, this morning, Lord, I just pray that you get me out of the way. Fill me with you, Lord, that, that I say everything that you, you need to be said, and don't let me throw in stuff that don't need to be. And Father, I just pray that you help us, help calm my nerves this morning. Just help me be exactly where you need me to be this morning. And Lord, I just pray for this message, what you've given me, that it does touch some hearts today. Lord, we just give you the praise and honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. All right. So y'all know me. Most of you know me. Anyway, Tim Barbie, campus pastor. But a lot of you didn't know a whole lot about our, our, my background from like 2007 to now, I've been going to Temple. But before that, I lived in a tent, you know, a lot of drug issues, a lot of homelessness, a lot of issues. That's why we have been working as a family with Unsheltered for like 10 years. Unsheltered International is a homeless ministry that we've gone from a lot of different states helping those in the same situation. And a lot of people, I say that because a lot of people have asked my 
background a little bit before we got here. Not a whole lot of people knew that. So I just want to kind of get that out of the way. So we've been in ministry for 11, 12 years now, doing mission work in, in different aspects and different areas. So um, this morning, I just want to talk about a good soldier. Like over those past 10 years, it was staying to what God's word was how it is to be a good soldier. I spent a lot of time in the military, um, just understanding a little bit more, I guess, what it means to be in the army to what it means to be a Christian, and they kind of run along the same lines. All right, but first off, I just want to say thank you. If there's veterans here, I would love to give you all a round of applause this morning, because I know without veterans, you know, we wouldn't have the country that we have. And this is kind of set up. we got 4th of July coming up next weekend. So I'm going to set this up a little bit more towards a soldier's aspect. Paul, here, he calls Timothy a good soldier. He calls a lot of people in the Bible either a good soldier or a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Amen? He often compares people to soldiers. That's what he's using. So if you've been in the Marines, if you've been in the Navy, Air Force, whatever, today I'm using soldier just because that's what Paul called people. All right, so I want to read this. First off, we're going to go with the soldier's creed from the army. All right, it says, I am an American soldier. I am a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and I live the army values. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined, physically and mentally tough. Trained and proficient in my warrior tasks and drills, I always maintain my arms, my equipment, and myself. I am an expert, and I am a professional. I stand ready to deploy, engage, and destroy the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I am a guardian of freedom and the American way of life. I am an, an American soldier. So to be a good soldier is this. It's to share in the suffering Remember that no soldier gets entangled in the things of this life. Verse 4, it says that, right? No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. The ones who enlisted us in this army, in God's army, is Jesus Christ himself. The creed can be substituted with all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it says the army soldier's creed. What about the Christian soldier's creed? Do we stand for those kind of, of values in our life? Is that something that we, that we live by? Is that something that we remember every day when we get up in the morning? Or is that something that we just kind of do on Sundays because that's when we remember to do it? Well, I want to help us this morning, and I say us, help me too, going through, I've got five different points, and I know when I say that, you're going, five. I know. It may take a minute. We're going to get there, though. I promise. <clears throat> so, number one is going to be your enlistment. You got to know who you enlisted. Who enlisted you into this army? You got to know that. You got to know your enemy. You got to know your equipment. You got to know your engagement. Where are you going to fight battles? What kind of battlefield are we looking at? And your end of time in this service, or ETS. And that's when we leave this world onto a better place. All right? So, number one, number one is enlistment. That no man warreth entangle himself in the affairs of the other. But look at that, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. He chose us to be a soldier. Yes, he gave us the opportunity to believe in him. He gave us the opportunity to be and volunteer to be in that army, which is like our army today in the United States, right? It's the only volunteer army in the whole world. We volunteer for it. Well, we volunteer for the service too. You got to know who you serve. Look at Luke 14, Luke 14, and 25 through 27, 25 through 27, says, And there went a great multitudes with him, and he turned and he said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple." That, that right there, that says a lot. That says a lot. And it's like everything in your life, you have to turn your back on. 
just to make sure you follow him. But not turn your back in the fact that, well, you're not supposed to take care of him, but it's where your heart lies. Where's your heart in that? It says, whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. A good soldier knows who he serves. They know it takes leaving who you knew, turning away from everything, following Christ. Christ is the one who we serve, right? Uncle Sam is the guy that we use. Everybody knows who Uncle Sam is. Everybody, when we're when recruiting stuff, everybody knows Uncle Sam, right? Most soldiers know who they serve. Uncle Sam is a representation of that embodiment of the government that they serve. Do you have a representation of who you serve in your life? We serve a risen Savior. Do we remember that every morning when we give up? Give up. Don't give up. When we get up, yeah, <laughs> don't, no giving up. All right, the one we serve, he took on our sins. He had no sin. He did all of that for us. So we have a, that freedom through him, just like we have freedom here in the United States. He's the one who we serve. Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed that ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The last part of that, the sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. How many of us really think every single day that you're walking close enough to God that, well, I messed that up. I'm just not going to, you know, you can't lose your salvation is what I'm saying. There's nothing in this world. He has sealed you. The creator of this universe has sealed you, if you belong to him, in a promise from, the, from here on, there's nothing that can mess with you. There's nothing that can take you out of his army, all right? If you're saved, you know who you serve. You turn from sin, you turn to God. He sealed us with his promise. Basic training. Now, a lot of people know that as boot camp, basic training, whatever you want to call it, right? You learn to depend on your command. You learn to depend on your sergeants. You learn to depend on each other. But most of all, in basic training, you learn how to depend on yourself more so than anything. Well, in God's army, he teaches us to turn away from our brothers, from our sisters, from our mothers, from our fathers, and we depend on him and him alone, the commander in chief in this, in this life, right? So he is the only one <clears throat> that we have to look at for anything in this world. But if we don't do that correctly, it's going to mess us up. It's going to mess us up. As a good soldier in the army of the Lord, we learn the same thing. We trust our commander in chief. We're given a Christian family, and if you look around, our Christian family is right here. That's why we don't forsake the gathering of ourselves, right? Because if, if you don't come to church, you don't know who your family is. Then you're still stuck in a long ranger Christian mentality, which is not the way God wanted us to, to go through this life. So let me ask you this. How many was in vacation Bible school? You don't have to raise your, hand, raise your hands. But remember, remember a song, and it says, I may never... March, come on, there we go, march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery, I may never fly or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army, yes sir, y'all remember that, and everybody's looking at me like, wow, what a sissy, I get it, I get it, I know, I know, but let me ask you this, I'm in the Lord's army, we're still in the Lord's army. We still have an enemy that's coming against us. Even though we learned that from a younger age, what about now? Is that a belief that you think of? Is that a belief that you even comes across your mind? We're out of the army now, right? No. No, the fighting's not over. We're still fighting in a war. We still have an enemy. That brings me to point number two. Enemy. You've got to know your enemy. Do you know your enemy? That's the question. First Peter 5.8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. We have an enemy that still has declared war on God himself. But he can't defeat God. He's not that big. But he can really mess with us. Why would he mess with us? Because we are the ones who God loves. But he will take us, and he'll twist us, and he'll turn us. And he'll take our words and turn them upside down. And he will try his best to devour us, not really even us, 
but our testimony and how other people see, oh, that's a Christian. No, you see how they're living. I don't even know why I need to change because my life is just like theirs. Why should I change anything at all? Why should I? Because that's what the devil has for you. He's going to sit there and ask you and tell you and make you question yourself through the whole, whole thing. But I'm going to tell you what. The good news is the army is still here. The Lord's army is still right here. Not only in these four walls, there are in people we met yesterday. We met all kinds of people yesterday handing out, you know, free food and stuff and even there. All kinds of people. Yeah, I'm a Christian. No, I don't go to church. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I got saved when I was a kid. No, I don't go to church. We heard that story time and time and time again. You forget, we're still in the army. We still have a battle to fight. Not that, okay, well, I'm just tired of going to church and all this COVID stuff. It messed us up for sure. But where are we at now? Now, my question is, are you still in the army or have you forgotten where we are? Have you been remembering where you are right now? Because I'm saying where you are now, you've been put here. I've been put here. All the staff here has been put here strategically by God. Every point he has commanded and ordered and he has recruited the best fighting force in this world. Guess what? We're it. Everybody's here. Everybody's here. You're in. Some say the, the Christian life is a pleasure cruise. You know, you get saved. Woohoo! You don't have to worry about nothing else. But tell you what, no, it's a battleship. It's an absolute battleship that we have to fight every single day. But maybe that explains why so many of us kind of get messed up in that, right? We forget who we're fighting with. We forget we're even fighting. You know, a lot of times we get picked off by sniper fire. Because how many people have gone to Starbucks? Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, favorite coffee place, whatever you want to call it. You're just walking along, and next thing you know, pow! You got something that comes in your life. You get sniper fire, right? Something happens. That medical thing comes back, and it's bad news. You got a family member, something happens to them, right? You lose a job, something happens to them. Are we prepared for that? Because that's the things we need to keep looking for instead of going through life with blinders on and wondering, man, I don't know where that came from. I don't even know what God's trying to teach me right now. But the devil is looking to destroy us all. And if we don't all gear up, get our mindset right, focus on a battle, that we will be the casualty. If you don't have your focus correct, that means you. That means me. That means all of us. Let me ask you this. Well, I say that this is what Paul is trying to encourage Timothy to be. Be a good soldier. Second Timothy, all of this, Timothy is all of encouragement from Paul. We go through, you read it, you understand that he wants us to be vigilant. He wants us to be soldiers. This is why Paul is encouraging Timothy. He said, be a good soldier of the Lord. Don't be a bad soldier. Don't be a lazy soldier. Don't be a missing in action soldier, which means, okay, you're saved, you're here for two months, Nobody ever sees you again, right? Prisoner of war soldier. And then this, is, this is one that gets me sometimes. That's the ones where you're trapped in your own mind. You're listening to what the devil says. You haven't properly got your stuff together and know how to properly fight the devil and what he's bringing against you, what he's telling you, what he's talking to you about. Next thing you know, he doesn't have to do anything. All he has to do is sit back and watch you defeat yourself. Don't be a prisoner of war in your own mind. Think Rick Warren calls it living rent-free in your own mind, right? So we don't get him out of there. We don't sweep him out. Anyway, don't be an AWOL soldier. Same thing. Take your place in the ranks of the people of God. You are a soldier and the God of this universe. He's the one that created it. He's the one that made it. He knows how it works. And I know every day we try to figure out how it works and how things are supposed to go. But do you go to the Bible and ask for questions? Ask for questions? Ask for answers for your questions. So that said, I was 17 when I was signed up to go into the Army. I was going to the National Guard, right? Because my brother is a great recruiter, and he taught me right into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he signed me right up for it. <laughs> but I, I entered the, the delay entry program, 17. I started doing guard drills and stuff down in Hansville. At 18, I went in and did my, uh, my basic training. But before that, man, I'm going to tell you, y'all look at me now, and I know it's, it's like, whoa, but this, I weighed 135 pounds before I went off to basic training. 
And I'm telling you, I was scared. Scared. I had no idea what to expect. I almost didn't go through it. I'm like, mm, no, I don't want to do this. How many of us has done that with God? I am so close, but I just don't know if I can. I really want to, but I don't know if I can. But I went through with it. By the time I was halfway through basic training, I decided this is what I want to do for, for as long as I can do it. And I, as soon as I got out of that, went through my schooling and all of that stuff, and then I went right into active duty and went straight to Germany after that and then, you know, all around the world and back. But let me ask you, have you made the decision to be a full-time soldier in the army of the Lord? Or are you still waiting? Are you still questioning? Am I, am I ready for that? Do I want to do that? Sometimes we get ourselves so worked up about some of the smallest stuff that we don't realize the things that will impact us is going to be that very thing that can save and help us for the rest of our lives. Now, I read about a, a Civil War soldier. He was kind of a reservist. He was a reservist, you know, set up in a place, and he was just there kind of hanging on, waiting for the marching orders to come in. But he was a watchmaker. So what he did, he made watches, and he was waiting. He made watches, and it was a while before things came in, and he started making more and repairing more watches. But when the finally marching orders came in for him to go into battle, he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it because he had five more watches he wanted to do. What does that say? He was a watchmaker. He was no longer a soldier. How many of us are watchmakers today? How many of us are no longer soldiers because we're struggling with march or marching orders that God has given us? Like, my family thought we were going to be in the mission field right about now. But God had other plans. He wanted us to do And so we were like, well, wherever you want us to go, Lord, that's where we're going to be. Are you doing that this morning? Are you asking God that this morning? Wherever you need me to go, Lord, that's where I'll be. Brings me to point number three, our equipment. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Everybody knows this. Hopefully you know it. This finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual, spiritual, that's a hard word to say, spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, that is putting truth all around your body, Right? And all of this comes from studying and knowing the Word of God. But having on the breastplate of righteousness, it's not your righteousness, because our righteousness is nothing, but it's having on Christ's righteousness. Amen? Taking, uh, and above, wait, and I lost myself. 15, thank you. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Preparation of the gospel. Are you reading the Word? Do you know the Word? Everywhere you go, are you walking in the word above all taking the shield wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked taking on the shield to take the helmet of salvation and a sword of the spirit which is the word of god praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints so gird about with truth your breastplate of righteousness shod by preparation are you prepared Shield of faith. Shield of faith is, is to secure. The shield back in the Roman soldiers' days, and I know I'm getting closer on time, and we got a long way to go still, but just bear with me. Um, the shield of faith, Roman soldiers' shields used to be the size of a door. They were huge, but it would cover, they're from head to toe, it would cover them, right? Shield of faith, to defend, to protect, to secure like fiery darts, they are to help you, protect you from the fiery darts of the devil. Having faith in Christ is how we allow Christ to protect us. The helmet of salvation, one of the most vital parts of a soldier's armor, because if you get attacked and you're hit in the head, it can be fatal. Your assurance of salvation is your helmet and your protection. Your sword, this is a sword of God, and not only is it for defense, it's for offense. That's the only thing that God gives us for offense is his word. For his word. So Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Daily, continually, put on the whole armor of God. Why would he say that if we weren't soldiers? 
Think about that. Charles Stanley did a thing. He did a message a long time ago and talks about this very same thing. He will not get out of bed every morning. And he did this so much that it's his habit to this day. He will not go get up out of bed without physically, like visually in his mind, putting on the, the whole armor of God. He says he does that before he does ministry work, before he gets up to go to the bathroom, to whatever he's got to do for that day, going to the office, going wherever. He makes sure he is shod. He is putting on the breastplate, the gird of truth. He's got his shield, he's got his helmet, and he's got his sword. So just remember, we have resources. God didn't say, you're saved. Now go do your own thing. We have to always remember to lean on him in whatever we're doing. Second Corinthians 10, 3 and 5, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Yeah, that's a lot. It's a lot. Like I said, there's a lot of verses in here, but, you know, God's, God's speaking. So we don't have to fight the war with conventional weapons. We have to fight this war with spiritual weapons, defensive and offensively. One of the main things that we have is prayer. Prayer. Greatest advanced weapon in the warfare that we fight today is prayer. On our knees. Preparation. But we also do it with a sword, the spirit of truth, God's word. All right, I heard a story about General Boykin. I don't know if anybody ever heard about General Boykin. He was a 36-year career general. He spent 13 years of those in Delta Force. But not only in it, he trained the Delta Force guys. Anybody ever seen the movie 12 Strong? General Boykin is one of the guys that they were using for that. His story goes along with, with this right here. So there's a group of Taliban this is back in the first beginning of the Afghanistan war. The Taliban, they were locked in in one ridge top. They couldn't, these, you know, the rest of the people that were fighting the Taliban at the time couldn't get through that because they were so dug in. So when the United States finally got engaged in that, right, they sent 12 guys. 12 guys. Now you've got hundreds of people from different countries around the place. The U.S. spent or sent 12 people. They sent an alpha team from the Delta Force. Twelve guys. Now imagine all these people that are looking at them like, what in the world are y'all going to do with twelve people? There's just no way. You know, they've been fighting these things for months and probably years, but twelve people is what we sent. So they asked them, tell me where the problem is, and they described it. The ridge line, that's where they're sunk in, and we can't get past it. One guy, they set up all their equipment, so one guy was the one who painted the target. I know if you've watched war movies, you know exactly what that means. He used a laser pointer, pointer, painted a target. Then a guy with a communications, with a radio, he called in for fire. And he said, just a few minutes later, you heard something coming. And it was coming fast. Next thing you know, that whole hillside was obliterated. It was obliterated. So he had... Uh, the same scripture in mind when he was telling the story because that neutralized the target that neutralized their enemy that made it no more just with a few different people right it didn't take a whole armies of nothing but second corinthians 10 3 through 5 said is what general boykin kind of referenced back to with that do you know we're given weapons do you know we're given equipment spiritual in nature and they are used for the pulling down of strongholds General Boykin used these verses to explain the power of prayer. Just as if, like the soldier that had painted that target, it released an arsenal from miles away, naval ships launched tomahawks, the Air Force dropped their bombs, and like he said, it neutralized their target, or they were just gone. They just walked on in because somebody called for reinforcements. Somebody called for help. Somebody had the resources, and somebody had the greatest force known to this world Standing at the ready. And all it took was some direction. You know, all it took was like, just paint me a target, boys. We'll handle the rest. General Boykin also said, the greatest weapon you have in your arsenal is your knees. Praying to the Lord 
That's preparation in advance before you ever stand up and take a step walking in the Holy Spirit. We have all this equipment at our disposal. We have resources available to us that sometimes we never tap into. We just decide we are going to charge the gates of hell with a water pistol. We never even allow God to get into part of our plan because we always do it ourselves. But instead, we need to spend more time on our knees preparing to use the equipment God has appropriated us for us to use. They are spiritual. The greatest warrior fights on his knees way before he gets on his feet. Amen? As Christ and as a good soldier of Christ, we know we are on the right side. We maintain a constant state of readiness. Our weapons are always at the ready. We are physically and mentally trained. We are conditioned. We are not tangled up in the affairs of this world, and we are focused. Every Christian has this capability. Are you living like you do? Are you living a, the way a good soldier does? Oh, my goodness. Number four, engagement. Engagement. So no man that worth entangleth himself to the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So if you have, is another one. Now, if you haven't figured out by now, I'm kind of a military buff and a little bit of military history. So bear with me. Um, this is called the, light, the Charge of the Light Brigade. It's written by Lord Alfred Tennyson back in 1854. It's about the Crimean War, and it's just a small portion of it. And there's a reason I want to read this. Theirs is not to reply. Theirs is not to reason why. Theirs is to do and to die. He's talking about 600 men that charged into a battle and about half of that unit was lost. They gave their lives. They fought blind. They fought without a purpose. They fought without understanding the mission. Many people think it was a modern-day soldier as well. This is what we do. We just blind obedience. We do whatever we're told. Charge a hill, invade a village without a question or a thought. They don't need to know the why or the what. They're just mindless robots doing what they're told. No, y'all know better than that. You know, hopefully you know better than that. So this comes from one of my older Army field manuals. It's called Providing, Purp providing Purpose. One of the duties of a leader is pr purpose gives soldiers a reason why they should do things under difficult situations and circumstances. It focuses a soldier's attentions and efforts on the task or the mission at hand, enabling them to operate in a disciplined manner in their leader's absence. Soldiers can best relate to a task or a mission if they know the ultimate purpose of their actions. Where's your attention today? Have you lost your reason? Have you lost your why? Baron Frederick von Steuben came to the United States in 1778. And that's a crazy word to pronounce, but there it is. At the request of General George Washington, he is one of the guys who came up with field manuals. He understood and he taught control. He taught discipline. He taught teamwork. He taught organization to the revolutionary force that we know now as the United States. He said, American soldiers do best when they know the why and when they are doing something. Manuel says that, they, that this observation was made over 200 years ago, and it stays valid to this day. Soldiers need to know the why. They need to know they have purpose. They need to know the mission and the objectives. There are not a lot of practical reasons for it. If there's a breakdown in communication, they have to be able to improvise, adapt, and overcome. So the soldiers need to know the why, the ultimate mission, According to Paul, good soldiers have an understanding of their mission. They know why they are doing something, and they have an idea of the what. Exactly what Paul is talking about is that a good soldier knows why he is soldiering on. Good soldiers know what to do and why he's doing it. They have an understanding of purpose and of mission. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10 says, Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or evil. So another way to say that is wherefore we labor. So in other words, we make our aim to well please him. And that all we're all going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ. But you're going to get 
judged, I guess, on the good and the bad in your life that you've done. So Paul is clearly saying we have purpose here. We have a mission to accomplish. We are here for a reason. We're not here to wander aimlessly through this life. We have God, a God-given purpose, a God-given reason. Our goal and our aim and our mission is to please the one who enlisted us. So a soldier's aim, it's his target, his direction, his purpose, his mission, his objective, his aim. It says this in the last two parts of this verse. It is to please him, the one who enlisted him as a good soldier. We want to bring him honor through obedience. We want to be pleasing to him, and we want to serve him. It's important to Paul. It's important to Paul that this understanding is passed on to Timothy directly. You've got to have a bigger picture. You've got to have an understanding of where we are. All right, my last point, number five. Your end of time in service. End of time in service. I know most Christians have an idea of what their purpose is, what their assignment is, but let me ask you this. Are you all prepared to hear, well done and good and faithful servant? Are you prepared to hear, good job, soldier, good job? That may help motivate you to get to use your equipment, the arsenal that God has for you. It may help you to chart your course for the rest of your life. Listen to what Paul says, 2 second, second Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at the day, and not to me only, but unto them also that love his appearing. At the end of Paul's life, he writes to Timothy and says that a good soldier of Jesus Christ is motivated by the mission. He understands the what, he understands the why, and he understands he lives to serve that mission. He's found something that is big enough and that is bold enough to give his life to. I don't know if there's any more encouragement to say to keep your own track, to keep your own course, to fight a good fight than those. SEAL Team 6, y'all remember SEAL Team 6, took out bin Laden, right? And they tried to get all kinds of reporters tried to get a comment from him. They tried to get something from him, tried to get him to talk about the mission, talk about anything. But there was a little bit later, one of the guys, he tweeted out, he texted out, Charlie Mike. A lot of veterans, a lot of army guys, you'll know what that means. Charlie Mike, that means continue mission. They knew that just because this one battle was won, they didn't win a war. They served a greater purpose and a greater mission that was bigger than themselves, bigger than the moment, and their, resp their response was Charlie Mike. You and I have a lifetime to Charlie Mike. We have a lifetime to continue our mission. A good soldier of Jesus Christ knows what the mission is, and someday he will stand in front of our commander-in-chief and hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Or, I want to hear, good job, soldier. Just good job. A good soldier gets enlisted. A good soldier knows the enemy. A good soldier prepares his equipment. And he's also prepared for the engagement. And a good soldier pays the ultimate price at the end of service on this earth. A good soldier, like in verse 3, shares in the suffering, shares in the endurance, the hardness of Jesus Christ. It really sounds like Paul knew what he was doing, and he knew what it was to suffer for Jesus Christ. For the last 200 years plus, soldiers just keep marching on. They soldier on. Marines improvise and adapt and overcome. Soldiers make decisions. They adjust. They keep going. The one thing that we don't do is quit. We don't give up. They soldier on. They ranger on. They keep driving on. They can't be stopped. That's our training. That's our discipline. That's our focus. The mission is too big to turn back. That's why the big enough is big enough to give our lives to, right? We're willing to pay the price for victory, and so should Christians. If we approach life like our military approaches battle, what if we were passionate about the glory of God? What if our training is deliberate, it's purposeful? We stay in the Word every day. We train every day. We learn how to battle those, those battles every day. What if we had a sense of purpose? What if we had a sense of meaning? What if we were willing to stop whining for the sake of winning? What if we don't get our feelings hurt every time we turn around? What if we just really was like a soldier through life every day, not worried about our feelings on our sleeves, but worried about God's story, Christ's story, 
getting the hope out to people, the hope in their lives, like we have in ours? What if we ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill Christians would just man up and soldier on? I think that's exactly what Paul is talking about in this, this point he's trying to make. So let me ask you, are you enlisted in the army of the Lord? If so, how's your equipment today? How is your engagement? What's your last engagement look like? Have you cleaned up yourself since the last time you got knocked out? Knocked down? You know, are you still dirty in the muck and the mire? And mm, do, you make th- do you need to make things right this morning with the Lord? How's your schedule? That's another one that gets me, because every time I look at it, how's your schedule today? You know, how's your time management? Do you have time enough for God? Do you have time enough to make sure all these lists of things are right? Are they right? If they're not, today's the time. Today is to, the day to get our stuff in order. It's the day that we need to be ready to be a soldier and not a watchmaker. Amen? All right, I want to read one last thing. and then See, I'm, I'm, I'm early. Woo, there we go. All right, I am a soldier in the army of the Lord. I want you all to pay attention to this because this one gets me, it gets me, it gets me. All right, the Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Scripture is my code of conduct. Faith, prayer, and the Word are my weapons of warfare. I have been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, and tested by fire. I'm a volunteer in this army. I am enlisted for eternity. I will either retire in this army at the rapture or die in this army, but I will not get out, I will not sell out, Be talked out or pushed out. I am faithful, reliable, capable, and dependable. If my God needs me, I am there. I am a soldier. If he needs me in the Sunday school to teach children, work with the youth, help the adults, or just sit there and learn, I am a soldier. He can use me because I am here. I'm not a baby. I don't need to be pampered, petted, primed up, pumped up, picked up, or pepped up. I am a soldier. No one has to call me, remind me, write me, visit me, entice me, or lure me. I am a soldier. I am not a wimp. I am in place, saluting my king, obeying his orders, praising his name, and praising his kingdom. A good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one has to send me flowers, gifts, food, cards, Candy or give me handouts. I do not need to be cuddled, cradled, cared for, or catered to. I am committed. I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough to turn me around. I cannot be discouraged enough to turn me aside. I cannot lose enough to cause me to quit. When Jesus calls me into this army, I had nothing. I promise you, I had nothing. And if I end up with nothing, I still come out ahead. If I win... I will win. God has and will continue to supply all of my needs. I am more than a conqueror. I will always triumph. I can do all things through Christ. The the devil cannot defeat me. People cannot disillusion me. Weather cannot weary me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. Money cannot buy me. Governments can't silence me. And hell cannot handle me. I am a soldier. Even death cannot destroy me. For when when my commander calls me from this world, he will promote me to a captain and then allow me to rule with him. I'm a soldier in the army. I am marching on, claiming victory. I will not give up. I will not turn around. I am a soldier marching on heaven bound. I am a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier today. What about you? Do you know who's called you into service? What's your equipment looking like? Do you know what kind of enemy you're fighting? What's your equipment looking like? Is it battle from the last, or weary, dirty, filthy, like I said, from the last battle? Are you prepared to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Have you given your heart to Christ? Maybe you need to get back into the ranks. Maybe it's time to stop playing and actually get real. Maybe it's time to start getting right on the right path. And if you need to do that, I'm asking you to come up this morning and let's make that stuff right. And I know this is not, it's a little bit different kind of message. And I really wanted to do this because of our Independent celebration coming up next week. I want you to think about 
the mentality that it takes to be a Christian isn't just, I'm going to fly by the seat of my pants and hope tomorrow's better than today. we got to be ready. Y'all, we have got an enemy that's trying to take us out every single day. Are you ready for that? Are you still worried about the little things in life? Or are we worried about the bigger things of telling people about God? Are you worried about somebody else's soul? Are you worried that somebody else is going to bust the gates of hell wide open because, man, I just ain't got time to tell them about God today? Where do y'all stand with that? Where is that?